Okay, yeah, this is fine. Oh, uh, good afternoon, you smarmy bastards. Welcome to another short vid of Crime Page by Biden and Dozen. Uh, I'm here on a Cretaceous limestone of West Texas. Always on a Cretaceous limestone. Always got to mention the geology because geology really affects plant life. All right, especially on a large scale, given millions of years. All right, you get endemics that grow only on the limestone versus, uh, you know, the ones that grow on the more volcanic soils, which tend to have a lower pH. But uh, regardless, I'm here to show you a member of a uh, genus that's uh, more common in eastern North America. But this one shows the evidence of millions of years of selection pressure in a dry environment. This is Vernonia larciniae. Larciniae, however you want to pronounce that. It's Latin, it's a dead language. So some of you in the Midwest, East Coast might know the genus Vernonia, colloquially known as the ironweeds. But have you seen one with uh, white leaves before? With hairy white leaves like this? This is really, this is something else. Look at that thing. Most of the flowers are done. It is hot as balls. Actually, it's kind of chilly right now. It's only 95. But uh, you can see those those pink styles poking out. Those bifid pink styles. Those two-branched pink styles poking out of that involucre right there. There's no, no ligules, no daisy rays, just disc flowers. The genus Vernonia, of course, is uh, it's got like 60 species in it. You get quite a few in uh, South America. You get many more in North America. And uh, many of them grow on the prairies in the Midwest. They're, you know, the, the ironweeds, they're beautiful goddamn plants. They're just lit up. You'll see them covered in butterflies and pollinators. Every native garden east of the 100th meridian should have one. But again, here we have a desert adapted one, all right? A perennial desert adapted one. Dies back to the roots in the winter. And then, uh, you know, it's mostly, I've only ever seen it growing in washes. I don't think you'll ever see it growing on ridges. Maybe I stand corrected if, you, if you're in an area of the Chihuahua Desert that gets a little bit more moisture, a little bit more precipitation, but I've only ever seen it growing in the washes here. And uh, it's just lit up. You know, again, we're a little late to see it in full bloom, just bright pink flowers, but I've seen people growing this in their gardens, you know, in West Texas and the Chihuahua Desert in New Mexico, et cetera. And definitely everybody should, because this is a banger plant. And again, it's just, it's adapted to the hot and dry, okay? Pretty, pretty, pretty freaking drought tolerant, okay? So you put this in your garden, you know, you destroy your lawn, you're not gonna have to be watering as much, okay? Just water it in when you plant it and then let it do its thing, it'll be fine. So, you know, and this, this is why I love desert. So normal Vernonias have really wide, broad, dark green leaves. This thing's got very narrow leaves. It's got all the adaptations of a desert environment. Very narrow leaves, and of course, what do plants do when they got heat and light stress? Given that there's not, if there's not too much humidity, if there's humidity, they can't do this because the, the hairs will just, the trichomes will just induce rot. But in an arid climate, they produce lots of hairs. And you'll see this in deserts all over the world, whether it's in South Africa or Chile or Australia, wherever. You'll see plants from these environments uh, producing hairs, you know, producing, you know, so many hairs that the leaves kind of turn white. You'll see them uh, reducing the surface area. That leaf is uh, reducing the surface area of that leaf. So that there's not that much uh, surface area exposed to that hot, dry air or to the sun. And again, the hairs help reflect light. They help keep uh, that boundary layer of humidity around the leaf so the leaves don't transpire too much moisture. And they keep the leaf temperature down. They prevent it from getting too hot. So there you go. Just It's, it's pretty incredible. When you know the rest of the genus Vernonia, when you know the iron weeds in the Midwest, and then to see a member of that same genus that's evolved to the desert, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty incredible. Anyway, I got a couple more things I want to show you, then we'll get the hell out of here and move on. All right, now this is pretty cool. Now this plant I've only ever seen growing on limestone. I don't know if it's an endemic, but I've only ever seen it growing on the limestone. This is Savalia sinuata, and it's a rather odd member of the Loisaceae, the Menzelia family, which is quite ubiquitous out west. Anybody who botanizes or knows uh, plants uh, in the western half of North America uh, would know this family, Loisaceae. It's also in Chile, uh, but that's a different sub I mean, They look quite, diff quite different from the North American ones. Anyway, there's the flowers right there. Uh, you can see the whole thing, like most members of the family, is covered in those hairs, okay? This, this one stings. The hairs uh, are, are, you know, they're barbed in most of the family, but in this one, they actually sting. Okay, so again, there's those flowers. But interesting about it is it's actually in fruit right here, and you can see, you can see what it's doing. It's using those hairs uh, as wind dispersal. So this that whole, what you're looking at, those little rads, that's the uh, sepals, that's the calyx, the fruit is beneath it. See that darker part? 
it's so covered in hairs it's kind of hard to see and they just readily detach and then I get picked up on the wind and disperse readily to a new uh, a new locale where they'll hopefully germinate. See these are all these were all these ones were duds they didn't get pollinated apparently. So this just like uh, the, the plant Cassinia which is the only member one of the only uh, actually it's one of only two species uh, that occur on the uh, African continent in this family Loisaceae. Cassinia does the same thing it uses its sepals as wind dispersal agents but the sepals in Cassinia don't have hairs on them they just work like little helicopter blades. Let's see there you go. So you got that ovary in the center and then the calyx the sepals around it and boom they just get picked up picked up by the wind and there's a lot of wind in West Texas and they take off. Oh look at him what's he doing over there? You see him over there? See, he's not gonna let us get close these bastards they're sly. Look at him. Okay he already sees me god damn it. hold on hey come here I just want to talk for a minute. Come on, you sexy beast. Get over here, goddammit. Get over here. Hey, come here. I don't have to step too far across the wash to show you another member of a genus that's, uh, you know, in, in more mesic environments with more moisture. It's, much, it's a much bigger tree, and it produces much broader leaves. But here in the desert, we see everything is reduced. This is Juglans microcarpa, all right? The little leaf walnut, the desert walnut. There's the fruits right there just about to be ready. You could see they're about the size of a marble, maybe a little bit bigger than it. Okay, and that's the biggest they get. The leaves, again, reduce that surface area, reduce that surface area that can transpire moisture to the atmosphere. You got these narrow lanceolate leaves. Again, they're covered in hair, okay? They're not glabrous. They got tiny hairs on them to help keep that moisture in and uh, to uh, reflect some of the light. But, uh, but again, they're edible, and uh, I'm gonna actually take some to grow. But it, and that's what it, it tops out at like 10 feet, 12 feet. And it only grows in the washes. You're not gonna see it growing up on the ridges. You're mostly gonna see it just in the washes. Well, another resident of the washes and a relative of Catalpa, another Midwest tree with much broader leaves and a much taller habit. This is Chilopsis linearis, the desert willow. But again, it's no relation to willows at all. Another reason why we don't use common names. There's those flowers, Bignoniaceae is the family there, just like that red trumpet vine you see planted in uh, gardens in North America, and just like Catalpa, when you see Catalpa's flowering. A bilaterally symmetrical flower with all that, uh, all that patterning to get the bees in there, get their ass in there and get them to brush up against those stamens on the uh, roof of that, uh, on that ceiling of that flower right there. And you go, Chilopsis linearis. Used in gardens quite a bit. It can get much bigger than this if it's got a lot of water, like in a horticultural setting, in a yard or something. But here in the desert washes, where it is hot as balls, but there is moisture uh, relatively close to the surface compared to the ridges, uh, it'll, it'll just, you know, tops out at about, I don't know, 12 feet. Sometimes they can get a big trunk, you know, sometimes I've, sometimes it seem like a foot diameter trunk. And migrants frequently take the washes because uh, it's a, you know, easy way to kind of stay out of the sun in a desert when you're moving north. You can see there's a bunch of backpacks here. I don't know if they were apprehended by uh, the border patrol bastards or what, but... Uh, and there we go, Diasporos, the Texas persimmon, Diasporos texana. Look at that, those fruits, they're not quite ripe yet. I just, you know, they are edible. I just bit into one. It was kind of bitter, kind of like a, a regular persimmon, uh, how it tastes like hell when you bite into it and it's not, it's not ready yet. You can see, and you get a hackberry up there. But this, this tree is beautiful bark. It should be used more in a landscape, and you could replace crepe myrtles with these, the dreaded crepe myrtle. Who hasn't been beaten over the head with crepe myrtles? Look at this thing's just, just draped in fruit. You got some gals right there too. Some uh, wasp or midge laid an egg in there. Look at it. See those little warty things? But I'm gonna take a couple of these because uh, they do, uh, they got some good seed in them. And I like growing this. It's a very slow growing tree. But uh, see, there you go. I just split that one open. You get quite a few seeds in there. Maybe four or five beautiful and this thing's this thing's super drought tolerant too i mean look it's growing out of a fucking rock right here it tells you all you need to know oh, yeah, come on let's go let's go what do you do you just lounging around come on let's go so again why is this cool why is this notable why is it not just another plant growing in a wash because it's a member of a uh, genus that's much more common in the more mesic and humid east and we can see the effects here of adaptation and natural selection 
in a dry environment, in a very stressful environment. Environmental stresses create speciation if they don't cause direct extinctions, okay? So maybe humanity, well, I mean, humanity is uh, affecting plant evolution. Just look at a lot of our invasive weeds. But again, a couple million years evolving in these dry limestone deserts of the Chihuahua Desert. The dry limestone washes of the Chihuahua Desert, and you can see the effects on a, a very common genus out east. What's, what's, you know, who knows when it diverged from populations further east with the dark green, broader leaves and a much taller habit. But, uh, you know, here, here we go. Pretty incredible. Isn't evolution uh, pretty wonderful? The more you learn, the more you understand it, all right? You can observe it on both a micro and a macro scale. There you go. That's all I got for you today. Have a great afternoon. Go fuck yourself. Bye.